Hi. Um, so I'll start also with a moment of introduction about myself and my project before um, I take you a little bit into the world where I spent my summer. So my background is that uh, I'm a lawyer and I work on labor and migration issues mostly in South Asia. And I've recently brought some of the questions um, that I'm working through to the Jurisprudence and Social Policy Program. And I think that I'd like to structure my presentation in some ways as an answer to a question that was raised in the back of the room, which is what are some ways that you can engage with and listen to communities when you're developing strategies? And um, I think that's really fundamental to doing human rights work that I can be proud of. And so um, this summer was actually the first stage of a new project that I'm doing. And one of the issues in South Asia that is um, really challenging in dealing with women's migration in particular is that transnational discourses on trafficking end up stigmatizing women's work and mobility. And so what you're left with is in a situation in which protective state policies actually limit women's mobility in a way that doesn't take into account how migration may be part of a process that women are actually choosing. And so what I'm working on right now is a litigation guide and a compilation of judgments that can be used by lawyers and advocates across South Asia to really think about um, how to protect women's rights and ensure the right to safe and secure mobility while still addressing questions like trafficking. And so um, the beginning stage of this project and what the Human Rights Center was able to support me to do in partnership with South Asia Women's Fund was meet with 19 groups um, across South Asia who are working directly with migrant communities to get a sense of what are the issues they're facing, what are the legal issues that we need to cover in this compilation of judgments, and what are the types of tools that are going to be important in projecting migrant women's voices into public policy discourses. And that's, um, that's really where I link into this panel, which is why women's voices matter. So where I wanted to start was actually taking you to Sikandarpur Basti, which is a slum in Gurgaon, where I had a conversation with a woman who was really talking about the day-to-day -day challenges associated with migration. And this particular video is part of a broader project called the Lockstitch Lives Project, which is an interactive documentary. And so I'll show you just a little piece of that now. So we're going to Sikandarpur Basti, and we're choosing the My Community option here. is I'll send you a link to this if you'd like to look at it, um, and I'll leave the volume off. What there actually is is a voiceover in the background where um, as you explore the community, um, you'll hear a woman who tells you the reasons why she migrated, how she migrated, and came to Delhi from Madhya Pradesh, and some of the choices she faces as far as balancing the work that she does with keeping her daughter safe in an area where she really doesn't feel very safe at all. And um, so this particular view you can see um, over in the corner allows you to navigate through the neighborhood as she tells you about her life and her experiences. Um, but what I was going to then mention, um, following listen, nis, l having you listen to the voiceover, was um, a conversation with an organization that actually works with women who are traveling from Charkand to this very same Basti in New Delhi. And they're um, part of a broader network called the Charkand Anti-Trafficking Network. 
And what they mentioned was that initially their policy was that when they saw groups of women traveling together, um, ten, 10 women, looks like young girls, looks like they're from tribal communities, they would call the police and the, to come and like get on the trains, get the women off the trains. And what they found was that pretty soon they were recognized in the train stations, and when they showed up, the women would start running away. And they decided to shift their tactic at the same time that recruiters were shifting their tactics. And so recruiters were no longer bringing groups of 10 girls on trains, because that was too obvious. Instead, they were sitting them two by two. And so what you're looking for then, if you're trying to see if this is a situation of recruitment and trafficking is, are there a disproportionate number of very young girls on this train who may be sitting alone, who may be sitting side by side with one other person? And they change their strategy, this organization. And what they do instead now is that they go and they speak to these girls in pairs um, in a more low-key way. And they say, you know, this is what you can expect on the other side. If you're going into domestic work, we do have situations in which people aren't getting their wages where they may be completely isolated in the households of people that they're working with. These are the types of rights abuses that happen. And a lot of times what women do is they try to leave that situation and maybe go through other networks to get jobs where they're part-time workers. And so there are ways that people make this work, but it's risky and it can be dangerous. And here's our contact information if you need anything. And if you want to get off the train right now, we'll help you get back home. And what they said that I thought was really remarkable was that 50% of the time, women get off the train. And 50% of the time, women stay on the train. And it really comes down to a personal choice about the types of risk that migrants are willing to take based on what they're facing at home and what they see as the opportunities for their families and their communities. And so in the question of this panel of why women's voices matter, what I was hoping to do was actually um, have you listen to a, a story of one of these women and see the lives that they're choosing between and so that we can think about as human rights activists how we construct strategies and solutions that are really in tune to grassroots realities. And I do think that there's a space for that. And I do think that there's a space for media um, to bring voices into public conversations. Um, and that's what I think I got an opportunity to work on this summer. Thank you.